Yeah, hello everyone, welcome. Uh, I am the other Jakub, not the maintainer. <laughs> um, I work at Paltrow on kernel networking and BPF stuff, and today I want to chat about what makes the Panda set and the Linux network stack today. Uh, I have five war stories for you. Uh, let's see if we can get through all of them, uh, depending on questions along the way. Uh, I'll have a pause slot after each section for questions, but also feel free to uh, interrupt me uh, so we don't lose context. All right, uh, is it possible to have a proper loopback subnet for IPv6? So this needs no introduction. Um, for IPv4, uh, we have like 16 million local addresses. The first one is assigned directly to the loopback device and the rest are present because if we have a special local route. Um, but for IPv6, we get just one generous, uh, generously one, just one local address. And that's due to no fault of the Linux network stack, of course, that's just what the specs mandate. Uh, but it's a problem for us. And uh, it's not that we don't like um, Unix uh, sockets. They're, they're great for local networking. They're more secure. You know, it's harder to accidentally expose them uh, to internet. And they are also as simple as it gets. There's no like routing code. You just shove packets from one socket to another. Um, but uh, we still need some local addresses because some time ago we actually uh, decoupled the public addresses uh, from the addresses to which we bind our sockets by using uh, socket lookup. And uh, sometimes we have services uh, which, which uh, want to use the same local port, so we need more than one local address for that. Right, so we weren't uh, naturally the first ones to, to uh, run, think about that problem. Uh, there were some efforts in the past to make the situation better. But as far as we know, this uh, didn't go anywhere. Uh, so we're stuck in the same situation. So what's, what's the next best thing? It seems it's, uh, these are unique local addresses for IPv6. Uh, they're supposed to be, uh, to be used only within your private network, you are not supposed to root them. Um, yeah, there, is, there, there are a couple blocks there. Uh, only one of them is, is uh, actually designated for local use. Uh, so we're going to see if we can use that uh, unique local addresses just uh, in a more narrow scope than the spec mandates. Uh, so there's this FD um, prefix there, uh, slash 48 within which we are, su we are supposed to choose uh, a randomly generated prefix for an own. So that's what one of my colleagues came up with. Um, and it's easy, really easy to remember because it's just FD00 loopback. Uh, and we're going to see if we can make it uh, so, that, that, so it's locally assigned to our host and also can be only used within the communication uh, on the host, not outside. Right, so uh, following what IPv4 does, let's, let's try to, you know, uh, assign the first address from uh, that subnet to the loopback interface. And if we try to do that, just naively, we'll uh, notice that, uh, yeah, the scope is not, not what we want. Mm, but, uh, you know, the IP tooling allows us to set it, so uh, that's my fault there, uh, except it, it doesn't work. <laughs> the scope is still global. Um, and it's not that the tooling is broken, uh, because if you capture Netlink, you'll see that yeah, the scope gets passed to the kernel as we as we set it. It's just that the kernel actually decides to ignore it and determine the scope by itself, uh, because it follows uh, another spec that says unless it's loopback or link local address, then it has global scope. All right, so we can set the scope, uh, but we somehow want to uh, narrow down, scope it just to the host. So what, what do we do? So we can end up in a similar setup as, as by default in IPv4, where loopback addresses are treated as Martian 
when they are coming from other devices. Well, I guess we can work around with, with a couple of firewall rules. All right, so we have one local address. Um, what about uh, the rest of the subnet? Well, we have any IP, fortunately, uh, which allows us to, to assign a whole subnet uh, to, to our host uh, via a special local route. And works great because we can then communicate over loopback using these addresses and the network stack is going to respond to pings. Uh, except you won't be able to bind to them, right? I can bind to the first address that I assign directly to loopback, but if you try to bind to any other address, you'll get uh, address not available error. Uh, why is that? Well, it's uh, because bind actually checks if the address is directly assigned to some of uh, to one of the network interfaces, uh, and if it's not, we're just gonna fail there. Uh, so we can't make that uh, routine happy, but maybe we can work around that. Uh, there's another check uh, just before that uh, with which we can short circuit the logic. And it will allow us to do that if we use either the IP non-local bind syscuttle or the free bind uh, socket flag. There's also IP transparent, but that's privileged, so we're gonna ignore that. So we have a tough choice here to make. We either use the per net NS syscuttle and risk it so that uh, our applications, if you misconfigure the address, you won't get an error uh, when binding. Uh, the address might not be assigned to an interface, or we make everyone else trying to use this uh, fake uh, IPv6 loopback set a, another, set a socket option. Mm. So that's all right, but not great. Um, can we do better? Well, we can already set socket options from BPF today, but we can't set free bind, but maybe we could you know, allow that. And then we already have a, kind of a, an early bind hook for BPF so we could uh, check if we're binding to our loopback subnet and set it automatically for users perhaps. That would give us a finer policy than what we have today. All right, that's any questions, comments to that? Okay, moving on then. Um, how TS recent timestamp resolution can lead to port exhaustion? Okay, so uh, here's a short experiment. I want to connect, make an egress connection to uh, a particular host uh, like 1,000 times in a row, open it, close it, and I want to always use the same local address for connecting outside, right? So um, in our first experiment, I'm gonna manually select the local address with bind syscall. And if you do that, uh, yeah, it will work, you know, every time uh, but now if we uh, make a change here and we also connect to the same host we wait a little in between but this time we're gonna let the kernel find the lo a free uh, local port for us but we're gonna tell the kernel that there is only one port to choose from right so if we try to do it this way uh, well that then that will mostly fail right we'll just succeed like a dozen times there and if we take a look like when, when do we actually succeed, uh, we'll notice that we succeed about once a second to, to reuse uh, that local address. So what's happening there? Well, a quick refresher um, from, from TCP. Uh, like when we're tearing down the connection and we're, we're the ones actively closing it, then you know when everything has been already sent and received during teardown, so our fin has been act right, uh, and we, the peer has we have received a fin from a peer. But we're gonna actually wait a little bit still, so uh, just in case our peer has not, uh, uh, you know, has not received our act to their fin, in case it retransmits our fin, uh, their fin, so we don't, so we can discard this old segment and it doesn't corrupt a new instance of the connection, right? And we wait for uh, two uh, maximum segment lifetimes, which on the Linux, uh, the default is 60 seconds. Uh, so that's, that's not what's happening here, clearly, because we were able to reuse uh, our time wait um, socket after just one second, right? And that's because there's something called TCP extensions for high performance. 
uh, which says that if you're using uh, TCP timestamps, which your peer reflects, right, you can uh, use that to, to detect uh, stale segments uh, in the new uh, reincarnation of your connection, right? And it's something that uh, has been implemented in, in, in Linux network stack for more than two decades now. And it actually uh, was done for the very reason uh, we, wa we want it, so uh, to, to uh, prevent uh, port exhaustion. Port exhaustion. Um, yeah, you need to actually enable it. Uh, by default, it only uh, is allowed for loopback, but we consider ourselves technical experts, so we do that. Um, but if you dig into the code, the function that actually uh, decides if you're uh, uh, allowed to reuse a time weight socket uh, uses a one hertz clock. So even while we have uh, millisecond timestamps, uh, well, we will actually uh, only be able to uh, reuse it after one second. Um, but you know, if I um, if I try to do a DNS query over TCP from one of our servers to Google, for instance, from the from send to the last tag, it takes me like five milliseconds. So waiting one second to then reuse that local address to make another connection, that, that seems very uh, wasteful these days. Um, right, so uh, we're wondering if it's something that we can improve. Like Very naively, uh, I just tried to uh, switch that one second clock to one millisecond clock uh, to kick off the discussion of that. Um, Right, then we got some valuable feedback from our TCP maintainer uh, to, to reuse uh, existing timestamping infrastructure and also one millisecond. That's too aggressive, uh, uh, something to rethink. And I'll be circling back to these uh, patches after the conference so you can expect some updates. All right, any comments? All right, moving on. This one will be short and fun. Uh, UDP segmentation offload does wonders for throughput, but can you always use it? What is UDP segmentation offload? Well, if you have a um, sequence of UDP datagrams that you would like to send out, you can actually uh, pass all of them at once to the network stack. So they would travel through the network stack together, and in this way you amortize the cost of, of executing all the code that we need to do. Uh, and you can leave it, offload it to your NIC firmware to actually chop them up into uh, UDP, uh, into IP datagrams, and also be, uh, fill in the L4 checksum for you because, well, that covers the payload. Uh, and, you know, when you're using, when you're uh, serving traffic over Quick these days, that's just a must-have feature uh, from performance point of view. So that is something that we have been using uh, happily in our patched NGINX. Uh, just passing large payloads, yeah, and datagrams will happily traveling over the network. Uh, but from, we noticed that from time to time we're getting an EIO uh, error uh, from uh, the network stack. And when we dug in and uh, to see when where that was happening, well, that was actually happening when our egress device was a ton device. So what's going on there? Well, you see, uh, to, to uh, use the UDP segment API, uh, your network device has to support certain features. One support scenario is where your network device is able of both computing the L4 checksum and doing the UDP segmentation in hardware. Or alternatively, the network stack, if your device can't handle chopping up uh, UDP uh, into segments, will do that for you in software, but the device still have to, uh, has to compute the L4 checksum. Uh, everything else outside of these sets, well, that just generates an EIO error. All right, but uh, when we duck farther into the GSO code, we notice that actually the core GSO code that does the USO fallback, it can compute the checksums as well. I mean, there will be some, probably some penalty, performance penalty there, because as I was told, 
uh, the data cache will be probably call, called by that time, but still, you know, it, as an application developer, why should I care through which network device uh, my traffic egresses, right? So maybe instead of uh, throwing an error, we can just uh, handle that gracefully and uh, do it all in software if our device does not offer anything, uh, checksum computation or UDP uh, segmentation. Right, so that's what, that's, what we, uh, that's what we set out to do and um, it's available and uh, it will be available in 6.11, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, life is not that uh, easy. <laughs> Uh, and of course, there were uh, corner cases there. Well, first of all, what's what's that? Like, what what if my device says I offer UDP segmentation, but I can't compute the checksum for you? And you can um, misconfigure your device, virtual device, like that. Well, that's obviously a nonsensical configuration, so we had to fix that up, and uh, so it's not possible to do. And then there's another corner case, like you, your device can advertise that it can compute L4 checksum, but if our IPv6 extension headers present, we're actually not gonna use that capability. So then, uh, well, we can't offload USO either, right? So we had to disable that as well. Uh, thanks to Willem for patiently reviewing all my attempts at getting it right. Uh, yeah, any questions there? Okay. All right, uh, moving on. Why sourcing return traffic when using BPF socket lookup is tricky for UDP? So as I mentioned er earlier, we don't bind our sockets uh, to the public facing addresses, which we use to actually source the traffic to the internet these days. And there are some uh, caveats with that. So if, when the datagram comes in, uh, we'll, you know, we'll check if it's a local IP assigned to this host. If so, we're gonna pass it uh, on to the socket lookup in L4 la layer, and in there, we're gonna have a BPF uh, program running, which will actually find the socket uh, which will receive this datagram, right? And that socket doesn't have to be bound to the same address as the destination address in the datagram. Um, the application then can read the message um, and it can recover the original destination address via an ancillary message. And that is needed so that, you know, when we uh, source return traffic, then we can tell uh, the network stack from which uh, address we wanna source back the reply, right? And on, uh, on return, we're gonna check, like, we're, are we sourcing traffic from a local address? And if so, we're gonna just send it back out to the internet. Right, but you see, um, our socket, it doesn't have to be actually bound to the same uh, local port number as the destination port for the datagram. That is uh, completely allowed. But it, in that scenario, if we try to uh, send uh, return traffic, well, we're gonna generate a datagram that has a uh, source port number, which is not expected by our peer. So what can we do there? Well, we, we thought, well, maybe we can improve that and actually have a, another C message or maybe a different kind of C message where we are able to also specify a, a source port number in, additional, in addition to the address. Uh, we would, you know, we would still check if this is a local source address we're using, but we can't just allow you to source traffic from any port because, well, that might be used by another socket, right? So maybe we can do a reverse uh, socket lookup to, to, to uh, do some sanity checking there. And only if that socket lookup uh, returns the same socket as you are using to send the datagram, we let, we let it pass through. Um, any problems with that? Well, mm, we don't have a lot of context, luckily, in the uh, socket lookup, so ev almost everything is available, uh, should be available on this reverse socket lookup, 
there is the uh, ingress interface index and it's not clear what to populate it with so that's an open question right so uh yeah my friend tiago uh, is actually working on this and uh, we managed to get out an rfc uh to kick off the discussion so if uh, yeah if you have any ideas for Right, any feedback? Okay. Uh, I want to ask the question is, uh, can we implement something like the NAT in the BPF? Like the, uh, we use the BPF math to maintain some status. So we can write a POC, like, like the issues you are pointing out, because the uh, POC is not, not, not the same, right? When you send back the targets. Uh -huh. So can, can we implement something like the NAT in the BPF? To, let it, to do some chancel layer here. So what's an NAT? Because uh, you, you are uh, talking about uh, the, the port is not the same, right? I didn't catch that. Yeah, the, 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 the port is not the same uh, as the yeah. service. Yeah, so, so maybe, maybe we can implement ah, some uh, chancel layer in the BPF. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got it now. Uh, right, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, um, I, yeah, you could potentially rewrite the port in your uh, net for in your uh, there's an egress uh, c group egress hook, potentially. Uh, we haven't tried that. Oh, but yeah, maybe maybe that's a way out. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, but of course that would that would come with some additional setup for your apl application and you would have to have state in two places, uh, your configuration. Okay, okay. But yeah, good idea, I, I haven't thought about that. Uh, so, so this is a possible solution? <laughs> okay. Potentially, yeah, I would say so. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, there's one more. I'm throwing my turn. So, but I think oh. at the point, you need the, if from the slide or from the next slide. Mm, next one? This one or? The okay. earlier one that you said the uh, C message. Uh, this one? Yeah, maybe in your patch, I think. You, you need, in the patch, you need to set a C message to tell which port or address you want to send from. Right? Mm -hmm. That is the information you need the user space to tell you. Yeah. And that's the information that the BPR program don't have at that point. Yes, yes, uh, it would have to be some, that's a very good point, yeah. Yeah, but I think I asked in the patch, but I, I think I asked, I didn't look uh, whether he would probably not, but, but does it have to run the VPR program to, to, again, because the user space has already specified what port or address it needs to send from, right? Right, but you know, we, uh, it's just uh, for, so you don't uh, start sourcing packets from, a port that is serviced by some other service, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I, I get what you mean. With, um, in theory, uh, you are able to bind a socket to any port, right, and, and do it anyway, because th th that's the workaround we've been using today. We just have a UDP socket for every port from which we need to source traffic, uh, and that's allowed, right? So. Yeah, maybe it's an overkill uh, to uh, to do it on reverse. I know. Uh, that's why we wanted to have uh, this discussion. Is, it, is the idea sound or, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, uh, I think we have time for one more. Uh, so let's uh, see if we can make it through this one. Uh, all right, how can early DMAX get in the way of forwarding traffic? Right, so we have this setup uh, in production where we have an application that uh, uses a TAN device and it just injects packets that get uh, routed out of uh, a physical device to the internet. And, uh, and on the same host, we also have uh, another application that it just uses regular TCP sockets. It creates a TCP socket and sends uh, you know, TCP segments through the whole network stack. And the important thing is that 
They both uh, source traffic from the same um, address assigned to, to the, uh, the physical device. So uh, the challenge we have here is like, how, how, how do we set it up so that uh, there is no port clash when, when we are sourcing traffic between these two applications? And how, do, how can we make it so the application that uses regular TCP sockets, it can still use the kernel facilities for finding a local port so it doesn't have to choose it manually and kind of cooperatively with the other app agree on which port is in use and which is free. Right, so we were thinking like, oh, is there a way for the application that uh, uh, uses tunnel to ton device to inject traffic to, to reserve a local TCP port somehow? Uh, and it turns out that you can you can abuse uh, TCP fast open for that. Um, it works. I'm not proud of it, uh, but it works. Uh, and it's probably the first use of TCP fast open for us. Uh, you are able to create a connect a socket, uh, reserve a local uh, for tuple, but not initiate the freeway handshake. Um, yeah, uh, if you if you uh, uh, inspect it with uh, Sogdiak, it, it it will show it's in a since uh, send state, but that's a lie actually. Nothing has been sent out, but the local address is assigned, and that's what we've been looking for. All right, so that's uh, so let's use that right. We we first uh, create this port hol hol holder dummy TCP socket. Uh, we know, uh, you know, the port is now reserved, and we inject uh, traffic through through our TAN device, um, and that works. But on return, what we notice is that we return traffic, so our CNAC in this case, it's not getting through; it's it's getting dropped by routing. Uh, so when we dug into that, uh, what we found out is that, uh, you know, when CNAC comes in. Uh, very early on, on the ingress path, we have early DMAX, which is this optimization that checks if there is an established socket uh, to which we can deliver the packet. And if so, it's going to assign that socket to the packet. And of course, it finds that placeholder TCP socket that we created. But then when we pass this uh, SKB to routing, because we have special uh, routing policy that like over overwrites local delivery, we uh, found out that like forward path is not happy with that. Like if you have a socket assigned to your SKB, then forward is just going to drop it uh, on the floor. Right. So how can we work around that? Well, we can um, kind of hide our uh, TCP flow from early DMAX uh, because the post uh, pre-routing hook is earlier than early DMAX, and we can reroute the, rewrite the destination there. That's one. That's one way we found out we can solve this. Or a, a nuclear option where is just well disable early DMAX for TCP, right? Uh, then we don't have a problem at all. And. Actually, my colleague ran an experiment in one of our data centers. How much uh, do we hurt when we when we do that? And it seems it's like uh, half a percent of CPU time. So if we are able to recover that elsewhere, uh, that's something we're considering actually doing. But you know, ideally, ideally, uh, we would like the sockets to be able to opt out of early DMAX, so they're not considered. Uh, by early DMAX as candidate for packet delivery, that would uh, that would solve it for us, uh, yeah, and would be a finer control than what we have today. Yeah, thanks to my colleagues uh, at work who actually worked on this. All right, any questions to that one? The fast open trick, I don't understand why it's uh, adding a route on the... Because the early DMX need the, the incoming route to be stored in the socket. There is a socket field to hold the, the DST. Uh -huh. But so if, we tr if you just create um, a fast open socket without anything sent and right. receive, the cache shouldn't be set. So I don't really understand that. Why right. is a problem? I, uh, I don't know either. I will have to go and uh, dig that out for you. For for me, early demux only works when the first packet is received. Then we 
cache the DST once yeah. it has been yeah, that's done, done, done here. So here, if you just create a dummy uh, TCP socket, the cache shouldn't be set. Yeah, that's the thing uh, I don't understand. But right, is it possible that the injected traffic created that? Maybe. I'll, I'll have to investigate. Uh, sorry, I don't. Uh, yeah, no, no idea. Any more questions? All right. Uh, yeah, if you uh, have any more questions or would like to check, um, chat about this, you can reach me at this email address or I hang out on the kernel mailing list. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is there a little gift for you?